Forget their eye-catching beauty and undeniable charm. These women are brutal killers capable of shocking levels of violence and striking fear in the hearts of even the most powerful drug lords. Van a tener un propósito y van a tener respeto! But what happens when these drug queen pins find themselves on the wrong side of the game and get kidnapped, murdered, and butchered? Today, we unveil shocking stories of both criminals and innocent women who were dismembered by cartels. La Flaca. After years of reign of terror, La Flaca became wanted by not just the law, but also the lawless. Unfortunately, the lawless caught up with her quickly before the law knew it, and she paid for her crimes most brutally. Born Jocelyn Alejandra Nino, but popularly known as La Flaca, meaning the skinny one, her acts are not what you would expect from anyone her size. She joined the Gulf Cartel at a young age not as a floor member, but as a deadly weapon. Due to her girly look and size, La Flaca was able to infiltrate the enemy's camps and also elude law enforcement for years. She did to her enemies the most horrendous things, earning her the moniker that is also a reference to Our Lady of Holy Death, which is a female skeleton saint venerated by thousands in Mexico and popular among some drug traffickers. Although La Flaca has committed serious crimes in Mexico, she only gained notoriety on social media on January 5, 2015 and that became the beginning of her end. It all started when an anonymous online user leaked a picture of her to Valor Portamalipas, a citizen journalist page that posts security updates and organized crime leaks. From there, her picture went viral on Facebook and Twitter, and she was immediately identified as a Gulf Cartel hitwoman based out of Rio Bravo, Tamaulipas. In the said picture, she was smiling while posing with a firearm and bulletproof vest while her sunglasses rested on her head and wearing a golden necklace. Initially, the picture's background stirred commentary on the apparent low-income lifestyle of cartel-employed assassins, which seemed to contradict the notion that those working for organized crime groups in Mexico live luxuriously. Later, it became the discussion of whether or not lifestyles like La Flaca's were worth the risk when organized crime bosses reportedly enjoyed most of the luxuries. At the time, nobody knew that the picture was leaked on purpose, but it soon became clear after investigation that the leak was likely done by a member of Los Metros, a Gulf cartel faction that was at war with Los Ciclones, the faction that La Flaca reportedly belonged to. The two cartels began a brutal war in Mexico in January 2015, and one of the tactics used by Los Metros to fight Los Ciclones was to promote leaks of its members on social media platforms in hopes that they would get arrested or killed. While these went on, La Flaca still carried on with her tasks for Los Ciclones, which included fighting off Los Metros by taking their lives. At the time, her group was operating in Rio Bravo, which was mostly a turf controlled by Los Metros, which meant that Los Ciclones were at greater risk when conducting operations there. Immediately, La Flaca's picture got leaked on social media. Los Metros members knew exactly who they were looking for, but it took them three months to eventually capture La Flaca and two other people from her group. While it all happened silently, on April 13, 2015, Mexican authorities in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, discovered La Flaca's dismembered body inside an ice cooler, abandoned at a Soriana parking lot. They also found the rest of her remains inside a plastic bag alongside another dismembered female corpse and a decapitated man, who were suspected to also belong to La Flaca's group. The bodies showed signs of torture, which suggested they might have been tortured to extract information of their criminal activities, after which they were executed with a headshot and dismembered. Upon discovery, investigators were able to identify La Flaca's remains due to her distinctive tattoo with the word Nino, her surname, on her forearm. And if that murder was not awful enough, the Los Metros members posted pictures of the horrendous acts on Twitter as a warning to Los Ciclones. In one of the pictures, La Flaca was shown beaten on the ground with the two other victims before her dismemberment. In a second photo, her remains were seen inside the cooler, and alongside the bodies, Los Metros left a written message threatening Los Ciclones, which reads, This will happen to all the filthy who support Los Ciclones. Keep sending these poles. The message also criticized Los Ciclones for using female foot soldiers, and told them they were going to be killing more people on their turf after which a signature was appended by a member of Los Metros, who goes by the moniker 65. After the discovery of La Flaca's body, 
it seemed other cartel members loved the method used in ending her as it became common in the following years. The same method was used on Gabriela Lima Santana. The only difference was that it didn't happen in Mexico, but in the heart of Brazil. Santana's case began with a missing report that was filed on March 13, 2021. However, according to the reports, she was believed to have disappeared even before then. While the cops began an active search for Santana, and her family hoped to see her again alive, their hopes were dashed when some municipal employees made a gruesome discovery. The employees were out removing garbage from a ditch with an excavator when they saw a suitcase as heavy as a rock. As they tried to pull it from the ditch, a human arm fell out of the case, which made them realize they had to call the police. Forensics experts recovered a head, torso, legs, and another arm from the suitcase confirming that a person had been butchered in there. Investigators also found saws and knives along with the body parts, which are suspected to have been used to amputate the person. Additionally, the suitcase had rocks that suggest the criminals intentionally wanted the case to sink to the bottom of the ditch. While the police didn't know the identity of the woman, they were soon reminded of a creepy video they received on March 1st of the same year. The video shows a notorious Brazilian gang murdering and dismembering a young woman. This video was the first link the cops had on the case. Eventually, Santana's fingerprints and the distinctive tattoos on her body, one of which was reportedly affiliated with a local gang, were used to identify her. What remains a mystery is how the police received the horrendous video. But it was however helpful in arresting some of the people involved, as the killer showed his face on camera smiling while committing the horrendous act. In all, two suspects were arrested. A 49-year-old man who was seen in the footage, and a 23-year-old man who allegedly filmed the video. After their arrests, police were able to know that there were other suspects in the case, but they could not get out the reason behind the heinous murder. This sounds like what is common in a place like Mexico, but according to a government database, Brazil also has high rates of violent crimes, such as murders and robberies. The homicide rate is said to be 30 to 35 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants, according to the UNODC, placing Brazil in the top 20 countries by intentional homicide rate. The next story takes us to Mexico, where the victim was given a taste of her medicine. This is La Guerra Loca. Most Mexicans at least knew the name La Guerra Loca, or maybe the infamous Crazy Blonde who became famous after a gory video featuring her surfaced on the internet. Several narco blogs released a video showing La Guerra Loca decapitating a man whose head and hands are bound with what appears to be duct tape. The gruesome video was a 14-minute video that didn't reveal the location or other details. La Guerra Loca would become famous as you can hear unidentified men advise her on how to perform the beheading, as well as their concerns that the event be documented properly on video. As she continues severing the victim's head with a machete, you can hear an unidentified man refer to her as La Guerra Loca, which means the crazy blonde, while another man says, this is what happens to those who help the Zetas. After she was done with the decapitation, she briefly posed with the head as a trophy, while others began to dismember the victim's body and skin the face and skull. However, Los Zetas soon got their retribution. According to reports, they captured four women and made them confess to working for the Gulf Cartel, the primary rival of Los Zetas. After that, the women were made to kneel in the dirt as a group of masked heavy gunmen stood in threatening poses behind them. Three of four women have their breasts exposed while one of them appears to be an aged and a little heavier woman, so she was allowed to keep her top on. One of the women is no other than La Guerra Loca, also known as Comandante Guerra. After your typical narco interrogation, in which the women stated their names, who they were affiliated with, and what their job was, the Zetas proceeded with decapitation and dismemberment. Obviously, because after years of showing the world how utterly useless Mexicans are when it comes to beheadings with a knife, out of complete embarrassment, they no longer use knives, and instead stick with axes and huge machetes. So beheadings are more about chopping the heads off, rather than cutting them off as it used to be. During the interrogation, the women admitted to being affiliated in some capacity with Jose Guadalupe Lopez, also known as El Ostion. One of them said she was his niece, while another said she was a halcona, meaning a hawk, also known as a lookout. As for La Guerra Loca, she said her name was Yesenia Pacheco Rodriguez, 
and said she was with Commander Gallo, a member of CDG in Altamira. The old woman got the fastest treatment and was beheaded quickly with the axe, while another had her throat sliced and left to suffer for a bit, but was then also swiftly finished with the axe. As expected, La Guerra Loca was left to suffer the longest. She had her throat cut with that huge machete and left alone while the Sicarios were dealing with other women. After finishing them off, the Zetas then proceeded with the traditional narco dismemberment. As crazy as that was, perhaps the most brutal is the case of this unnamed girl. She was only six years old when she met her untimely death at the hands of crazy cartel members. But no one would have known what truly happened to the poor girl if a witness whose name was not revealed to protect his family didn't testify in court when the nemesis eventually caught up with the assailant. On July 15, 2015, Los Zetas' ex-boss Marciano Milan Vasquez known as Chano was captured for drug-related crimes and also kidnapping and murder amongst others. During his trial, a witness gave an account of how Chano laughed as he used an axe to chop up a six-year-old girl in front of her bawling parents, telling the father it was, so you can remember me. He then ordered the girl's parents hacked to death. Witnesses who once worked with high-ranking Zetas have described being told of Chano's involvement in massacres across Mexico's Coahuila state. But this particular witness was the first to testify he saw people die at Milan's hands and on his orders mentioning about 18 in all. According to him, most of them were killed in the same gory way chopped up with an axe, with the body parts then burned in barrels. The witness who was also a drug trafficker said he was kidnapped in February 2013 and held for 13 days for the loss of a marijuana load seized by the US Border Patrol. The Zetas took him to locations in and around Piedras Negras, which borders Eagle Pass, and forced him to watch the killings of other victims so he would know his fate if he didn't get the money he owed. He also testified about two executions of adolescents or teens who sold newspapers at stoplights in Piedras Negra. In one, four were dismembered and burned, while two were slain the same way in another incident because the Zetas suspected them of being spies for a rival cartel. He also recounted being taken to a riverbed near Piedras Negras, where Zetas delivered three men suspected of being with Mexico's military and made them kneel. While captive, he was allowed to text his family and acquaintances to plead for money so he could be released. One of his relatives then sold her house to provide $20,000, which was enough to free him. But Chano told him he had to come up with another $100,000 because he couldn't come up with the $20,000 fast. In the end, Chano was sentenced in federal court to three consecutive life sentences. Before we tell more gory stories, let's go into our subscribers pick. In a world where choices are made and paths are chosen, some people only have two options, be a drug trafficker or die. Such was the case of the witness who took a stand against Chano, who detailed how he had to ship drugs to Chano under duress, after he saw him kill a person who chose not to. However, people like La Flaca didn't do it under duress. Everything about her seemed like she was happy doing her job as an assassin for a drug cartel. According to reports, girls like La Falca don't become assassins from the first day, but they start from being prostitutes for the cartels, after which they work their way up to being foot soldiers, eliminating the ops for their group. What is unclear is the benefits that would have made anyone choose such a bloody path and if they ever think of the consequences of their choices. Anyway, what do you think about these cartel women? Do these punishments serve them right considering their actions? Or would it have been better if they got caught in the web of the law? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. Next on the list of the brutally murdered is Griselda Blanco. On September 3, 2012, at age 69, Griselda Blanco was murdered in Medellin, Colombia, when a gunman on a motorbike shot her after she exited a butcher shop. This murder was carried out by Blanco's rivals, as the method of execution was an echo of the drive-by murder method that she had used to take control of the drug trade in Miami. Blanco a terrifying drug lord didn't seem like one who had much choice growing up as she was born on February 15, 1943, to an alcoholic sex worker who relocated to Medellin when Blanco was around three. It is reported that she might have been abused by her mother's clients at a young age, and when she was 11, she purportedly helped kidnap a 10-year-old boy from a wealthy family in the Medellin area. When the family wouldn't pay his ransom, Blanco allegedly shot the abducted child, 
At that time, she had become a pickpocket and sex worker. Blanco had lost her heart at a very tender age, which was what helped her in running the cartel business. Her first marriage didn't work out, but her second marriage landed her in the home of a drug trafficker who introduced Blanco to the trade. She initially trafficked marijuana, but soon switched to cocaine, which was easier to transport. Blanco had female couriers wear bras and girdles with special pockets to secretly carry the drug into the United States. She was successful, and the success in turn drew attention from the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency. But the hands of the law soon caught up to her in 1975, when Blanco and more than 30 of her partners were indicted on federal drug conspiracy charges as part of a wide-ranging investigation termed Operation Banshee. However, Blanco escaped arrest because she had fled to Colombia. By the late 1970s, Blanco was in Miami, where she established a massive narcotics ring that at its height was reportedly trafficking 3,400 pounds of cocaine each month. And as you must have known, you can't be in the business without violence. Blanco would eliminate people to avoid paying them money she owed because they owed her money, or if she felt they had disrespected her. She is credited with fine-tuning the murder method of having hired killers commit drive-by shootings on motorcycles, which made it easy for the assassins to vanish from the scene. Also, she was responsible for most of South Florida's murders from 1979 to 1981. In 1982, Blanco was behind the death of a two-year-old, who was an accidental casualty in her attempted takedown of a rival. As her business grew, people began to use nicknames like La Madrina, meaning the godmother, Cocaine Queen, Godmother of Cocaine, and Queen of Cocaine to refer to Blanco. For many years, she eluded law enforcement as she dyed her hair, lost or gained weight, or used one of multiple aliases. Eventually, the DEA tracked her down after she moved to California in 1984, and she was arrested in February 1985 in Irvine, a city south of Los Angeles. Blanco's trial, which took place in New York, ended with a conviction on one count of conspiracy to manufacture, import into the United States, and distribute cocaine. She was then sentenced to 15 years in prison where she still had the power to allegedly plan for associates to kidnap John F. Kennedy Jr. to use the former president's son as a bargaining chip for her freedom. While still a federal inmate, Blanco was transported back to Miami to face murder charges. She risked the death penalty, but the case against her derailed due to a strange turn of events. Somehow, prosecutors ended up offering Blanco a deal, and in 1998, she pleaded guilty to three second-degree murder charges. She was released from prison in June 2004 and deported back to Colombia. On returning to Colombia, Blanco met her death from a drive-by shooting, just as she had done to her enemies in the past. After her death, authorities estimated she was responsible for about 40 murders, while others believed she was responsible for up to 250 deaths. Next is... Karim Lisbeth Ortiz. This incident takes us to Mexico's Calaya City on a Saturday where a wedding ceremony was turned into a murder scene. The bride, Karim Lisbeth Yepes Ortiz was standing on the altar opposite her soon-to-be husband, known in the Mexican criminal underworld as El Calamardo, at the Our Lady of San Juan Church, when a volley of bullets was fired as the ceremony was about to end. These bullets killed Lisbeth and her groom with another man were abducted. It was later discovered that Karim Lisbeth Yepes Ortiz was the sister of Jose Antonio Yepes Ortiz, known as El Maro, leader of the Santa Rosa de Lima cartel. Though Lisbeth was not trafficking drugs, she was in charge of the organization's finances. According to reports, the attackers came from the Jalisco New Generation cartel, wearing bulletproof vests that had the name of the cartel during the assault. While a hail of bullets were flying around, the cartel members were not the only ones hit. An 18-year-old bystander riding a motorcycle also fell victim to the incident after a bullet in crossfire hit him. It is known that El Mencho's CJNG had a feud with El Maro's group, but while El Mencho operates in three-quarters of Mexican states and oversees a drugs empire spanning the Americas and Europe, El Maro's upstart Santa Rosa de Lima cartel is mostly involved in the theft of fuel from local pipelines in Guanajuato. El Maro's group, as little as they may be, have also allegedly threatened the Mexican president by leaving a banner in Salamanca, Guanajuato ordering the president to take his security forces out of the area, or else innocent people would die. However, El Maro denied placing the banner and instead blamed El Mencho's crew for setting up the stunt to make him look bad. 
The war between the two groups started back in 2015 when the CJNG went to Guanajuato to gain a foothold in the local oil theft economy. Soon, the Santa Rosa de Lima cartel was formed to fight back against El Mencho, therefore leading to bloodshed in the region. Mayra Limas Although it didn't start with Mayra Limas, it ended with her death. Marixa Limas Perez, known as La Patrona, the female boss, built a criminal empire through cold-blooded murder and drug trafficking in a small South American town. She was however arrested for good in 2017, after being handed down a 94-year prison sentence for several brutal crimes she committed. But there was a point in Marixa's life that she ran for mayor, and it came after the tragic death of her sister. In 2011, Maria had organized a meeting with people from the local community as she was running for mayor of the town of Moyuda. But on that day, a group of armed men with shotguns and AK-47s opened fire at the meeting, killing eight people, including Myra. Her face was destroyed, and she was found by Marixa lying in a pool of her own blood. Being mayor was a family business, as Marixa's brother Magno held the position until he died in 2009 of a heart attack. After his death, Mayra took over to finish his term when she was murdered. In 2011, Marixa stepped in to replace her sister in the mayoral race but lost to Carlos Marroquin. And there, things went from bad to worse for La Patrona when she was sentenced to 94 years in prison. During the arrest, six former members of the police force were arrested for being a part of Marixa's gang. But her criminal career wasn't over yet. In 2016, she attempted an escape by jumping over the prison's wall with the help of other prisoners, but was arrested shortly after. Just one year later, she attempted another escape from a military prison this time dressed as a security guard. When the authorities finally found her two weeks later, she was in El Salvador and had dyed her dark red. It is believed that Marroquin, a drug lord, was behind Mera's shooting, but he has never been arrested or charged for her murder. Marroquin also claims Marixa has tried to kill him on three separate occasions, once placing a bomb on a bridge he was due to cross on his drive home from work. Since the bomb didn't detonate, Marixa has denied any involvement. To date, Marixa is still fighting for her freedom saying she doesn't deserve to be in jail. While her efforts didn't yield her freedom, they sure earned her the name Female El Chapo for her successful escapes. Sabrina Duran Montero Sabrina was a famous Chilean TikToker who was brutally murdered in broad daylight. Her last recorded TikTok just before her death has over 5 million views. In the video, she is wearing a Tommy Hilfiger t-shirt and gold jewelry while she showcases hair products in the video. Sabrina went by Joaquina Guzman on TikTok, an obvious reference to Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo, the former Sinaloa cartel boss. She wasn't just a TikToker, she was also a convicted drug trafficker who spent over a year in jail and was released in May 2023. Duran kept on posting videos behind bars, sharing her urban reggaeton dances and songs as the narco queen of Peñaflor, the nickname she earned as the leader of a criminal gang in the Santiago suburb of Peñaflor. According to reports, as the youngest of nine siblings and mother to a 10-year-old boy, Duran, as her friends called her, grew up around drugs, and she got involved in the drug business as a young teenager. She grew in the business and didn't hide her involvement, leading young people to often look up to her for her wealth and her power. She demonstrated her immense power on the authorities with her prison videos that show her dancing reggaeton while wearing flashy jewelry. Duran Montero rose to fame as a TikTok sensation after she started posting videos of herself dancing or talking from behind bars where she was serving time in Chile for drug trafficking. But that didn't last for long as she was attacked after her release in Southwest Santiago by assailants, who shot her seven times and then took her car, which was later found burned and abandoned. Duran was left to die on the road and eventually succumbed to her injuries the same day. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.